I'm often asked, you know, John, you spend most of your time writing on government and politics, and yet you spend a lot of time recently researching and writing on education. Where's the connection? Well, it's an unusual one. Let me put it this way. Politics and education have a lot more in common, especially when you than you think, especially when you cover Congress. I've often asked to come up with a metaphor to describe Congress, the way that it works. The best one I've come up with is that it's a lot like a place that each and every one of you spent several years of your life in. Because if you look at Congress, the way that it operates, the cliques, um, the interplay between people, the shenanigans, the hijinks, what is Congress but high school with a whole lot of money? <laughs> and what is Congress but our old student council from high school? Except that it is $1.5 trillion to spend and very little adult supervision. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is that even high schools in America today, uh, comparing <laughs> them to Congress is being unfair to Congress. My interest in education, I think, from a very personal level, comes from the fact that I went to and graduated from what was considered a very good public high school in Northern California in the foothills of the Sierras. About every three or four years, which as you know is a whole generation in high school, I go back to speak to a class there. Every time I go back, I come back frightened, my hand almost shaking, because the quality of the students that I address deteriorates that much each time I go back. Each time I go back, I come out of that classroom <laughs> thinking something I never thought I would think. I'm glad I'm not younger because I might be one of these students. It's a frightening, frightening thought. But it's true. The dirty little secret of America's suburbs today is that most people in the suburbs think of their local high school much like they think of their local congressman. All those other congressmen are bad, but my guy's okay. Well, a lot of people think it's all those other high schools that are bad, but my high school is okay. I'm here to tell you that, yes, high schools vary, and there's still many good ones, but the average high school in America's suburbs today, no, it isn't horrible, but it's mediocre. And in a world economy where international competition is important, we are going to fall further and further behind if we don't have radical, real reform soon. 20% of America's high school students don't know what the Holocaust was. A third can't find France on the map. 12% of the students in Ivy League colleges, as freshmen or sophomores, don't know that it was Thomas Jefferson who wrote the Declaration of Independence. These are the Ivy League campuses. Now, of course, the real crisis in America's education isn't yet in the suburbs. It's been the same place where it's always been, the inner cities. Most of the people in this room already have choice in education. You choose to move into a community where you feel the schools will be good or better than where you lived before. Of course, people in the inner cities don't even have that choice. They're prisoners of a decaying system. Most of us don't spend a lot of time in the inner cities. I certainly don't. But when I moved to Washington in 1982 to work for Evans and Novak, I can assure you they didn't pay very well. Uh, I moved into a row house uh, with three other um, young student journalists in Washington, D.C., near Howard University, 1735 First Street. Uh, we were celebrated on the block. Uh, we were probably the first uh, white household in the entire block in years, and we were clearly a sign of rising property values. <laughs> <laughs> I lived two years there. I learned several things. I had a couple of my prejudices confirmed, but I had a lot more disabused. What I learned about people in the inner cities is that they're a lot more like us than we sometimes think. They have the same hopes and the same aspirations. And if they get a decent education, and if they get a decent job, and if they see that there is a reward to hard work, they will work themselves up out of poverty. And that has been the history of every immigrant and every minority group in America. What has happened since the 1960s is we have taken away those incentives to hard work. We have closed off the inner cities from the functioning American economy, which has blessed so many of us. 
And of course, what is the single worst thing we have done to the inner cities? We have saddled them with a public education system which is a national disgrace. It is now easier to smuggle a submachine gun into many inner city high schools than it is to smuggle in something like a moral value. Right now, the average black student in America is probably about three or four grade levels behind what he should be. The average white student is probably one or two grade levels behind. It doesn't have to be this way. There are functioning schools in the inner cities that do provide a quality education for all young people, regardless of race or background. Pay attention to this. An average black student who attends a private school, Catholic or secular, has a 37% better chance of going on to graduate from college than the average white public school student who graduates from a public high school. This is not an issue of race. It is an issue of opportunity. Given the proper opportunities, all people can do far better than we think, can do far more to bring out that which is the best within them. It is, I think, a terrible tragedy and an irony that we went through a wrenching civil rights revolution in this country about 30 years ago to overcome the oppression of Jim Crow. Now we are in danger of having it replaced with a new tyranny the tyranny of ignorance. We are, no, we are not equipping the current generation of young people to really fulfill their best, their potential in life. That is why educational choice has come to the fore. There are private school choice plans here in Atlanta that Matt Glavin has helped set up, in Indianapolis and in Austin, <coughs> all throughout the country. In Milwaukee, Polly Williams, a brave state legislator whom you've probably heard about, has set up the first state-funded voucher program. And yet, these programs, as modest as they are, are met with bitter and implacable opposition. I covered recently the effort to qualify an initiative for vouchers for educational choice in California. The California Teachers Association came out in force. They would surround the tables where they were trying to collect signatures, heckle them, sometimes even physically prevent people from signing. How much do the teachers' unions and the educational establishment oppose choice? Listen to the words of CTA President Del Weber, president of the largest teachers' union in California. Quote, why are we blocking, why are we trying to prevent the educational choice initiative from qualifying for the ballot? There are some proposals that are so evil, his word, evil, that they should never even be presented to the voters. We do not believe that we should hold an election on empowering the Ku Klux Klan, and we would not think it is undemocratic to oppose voting on legalizing child prostitution. Destroying public education, which choice in our view would do, belongs to that category." Unquote. That's the battle line. Now, I must say to Mr. Weber, he really sells public education short. Public education in this country has had a strong and vigorous past, and it will have a strong and vigorous future. If is it is exposed to the same guiding principle that motivates all of us in life, competition. Public education in Chile, where they've had full educational choice, any parent can choose between a private or a public school for the last 15 years in Chile, public education still has 70% of the students. The same is the case in the Netherlands or any other country that has tried educational choice. Public schools will improve if choice is presented as an option. They won't go out of business. This is a way of saving public education from itself. How do I know this? Milwaukee and Indianapolis, the two places where educational choice has the strongest beachhead. In Milwaukee, they elected a new superintendent who was an ally of Polly Williams, and he is running around trying to set up new magnet schools, trying to set up new public school choice programs. Why? Because a mere 600 kids have left the public school system and used vouchers to go to private schools. In Indianapolis, Pat Rooney, the head of Golden Rule Insurance Company, set up a privately funded choice program, which has taken only 900 students out of the Indianapolis schools. What's been the response of the Indianapolis education establishment? I was there two months ago. They have scrambled to set up their own choice program, taking out full page newspaper ads. 
Just the injection of a little bit of competition shakes up the establishment and realizes that they have to change their old ways. And they know there are problems. City after city, go and look at the percentage of public school teachers who send their kids to private schools. It is double or triple the rate of the population as a whole. Now these are very informed consumers. My question is, what do they know about the public school system that we don't? Why are they sending their kids to private schools, even though they are teaching in the public schools? Where is choice going? Well, I think it has a very bright and promising future. There's some setbacks. Bill Clinton, who used to support educational choice, who wrote a very complimentary letter to Polly Williams, has now come out against it. He needed the support of the teachers' unions. And sadly, I think he's reversed his position. But Bill Clinton, I think, in his heart of hearts, know, knows that choice is the answer. And I think the more and more that he sees that his educational reforms do not deliver the results that he expects, the more that he's going to come around to the choice way of looking at things. Because he himself knows the value of choice. When he was seven years old and his divorced mother moved him to Hot Springs, Arkansas, she didn't like the inferior county school that was then available. She said she wanted the very best for Bill because she knew that he would be an extraordinary person. She didn't take him to public school. She enrolled him in the local Catholic school. Blant Hurt, who was a businessman in Arkansas who has set up his own choice program, did some research. He found an interview with Mrs. Virginia Kelly, Bill's mother, in the Arkansas Catholic. She said, I realized Bill was very special. I decided I'd put Bill in a good school and I wouldn't settle for anything less. Sister McGee was so right about Bill. Bill learned to sit and wait until it was his turn to answer questions. Bill learned to discipline himself. Bill learned to increase his self-esteem. I will never forget the nuns for as long as I live for giving Bill such a good start. His third grade teacher, Monsignor John O'Donnell, took that point further in his comments to the Arkansas Catholic. Quote, I aroused young Bill's interest in world history and politics when I taught my course in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. At the end of the course, Little Willie stood up and said that if he had been emperor, Rome wouldn't have fallen, unquote. Well, I guess some things never change. I guess he no longer will ever look back. He didn't need any more self-esteem <laughs> at that point. But notice Mrs. Kelly's comments. I wanted the best for Bill, and I decided that he should go to another school. Isn't that what all parents in America want? I think so. And, yet, and she was able to do that. She was lucky that there was a Catholic school with a low tuition in the neighborhood that she could afford. Most Americans don't have that opportunity. But Bill Clinton has forgotten that. And I think this is the crux of the debate. During a discussion in the New Hampshire primary, Bill Clinton was asked by Cokie Roberts of ABC News the following question. If your daughter went to a public school where every day she was shaken down for lunch money, she was afraid to go to school and be beaten up, and she was learning hardly anything, you, Mr. Clinton, would have the option of sending her to a private school. And as we know, Chelsea is going to Sidwell Friends, a private school in Washington. Mr. Clinton, why shouldn't a black mother who is in the same position not have that same option simply because she can't afford to do it? Well, Bill Clinton is usually not at a loss for words, but he gulped a few at that one. He said, this question is difficult and painful, but my answer to you is no. We should not have a private voucher system our public school systems are underfunded. Well, I'm afraid to say that this is one of the great myths of America. Our classrooms are underfunded. Our school systems are not. Only 52% of the money spent on education in Georgia ends up in the classroom. 48% is taken by what Bill Bennett calls the blob, the administrators. In New York City, where I live, there are about 300,000 students. There are 3,000 administrators. The Catholic schools have 150,000 students. They have 30 administrators. That's where the money is going. The average school district in America spends about $5,800 a year per pupil. That's $175,000 a classroom. I defy any one of you to be marched into a classroom in America, be given a check for $175,000, and that you couldn't find somebody who
would deliver a quality education to the 30 kids in that room? Of course you could. Any one of us could. But it's not happening. In Atlanta, it's $5,600 a year. In some parts of DeKalb, it's much higher. I'm told by Matt Glavin that there's a high school in this area, public high school, that spends $11,000 a year. But much of that money, of course, never sees the classroom. It's time that we recognize the dollars in education should follow students, not bureaucratic systems. You know, we recognize that people have a need to eat and have good nutrition in this country. But we don't set up government food stores for that purpose. If we did, I can assure you we'd have long lines and poor selection. And they'd be sued for false advertising every day. We give people vouchers, food stamps. And they go and buy the food that they want. Well, why doesn't, why shouldn't that work in education? If it's good enough for something as basic and as important to people as food, I think it's good enough and important enough for something like education. No one is saying that government doesn't have a responsibility to educate students. But shouldn't be the parents and the local community that decides where those dollars are spent? Shouldn't they follow the students and not the system? To paraphrase a famous political slogan from the 1960s, in education, today we need a choice and not an echo of a failed past. Only then will America bring out that which is the best within its students and that which is the most noble. Thank you. As we normally do, uh, we've asked John to take some questions, and education is an issue that's important to me, so I'm going to begin, uh, take the opportunity to begin. John, uh, other parts of the world, what's happening in terms of school choice, not just in the United States? We fought a Cold War and invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the fight for freedom and choice in people's daily lives. Russia has changed dramatically since the fall of communism, changed more dramatically than we can possibly imagine. In January, they instituted full educational choice for every student in Russia. Now, admittedly, there's a bit of a turmoil over there. It's being phased in. <laughs> but it's going to happen. And I can assure you that right now in Moscow, a student in Moscow has more freedom as to what school he or she will attend than a student in almost any American city. We fought a Cold War, and now Russia, having liberated itself from communism, is marching ahead of us. They're not the only country. Poland has had school choice, full school choice, for four years. I had the privilege of meeting with the Polish minister for private education. She came over and she said, I'm so glad to meet you. For the last three weeks, I've been going around and meeting with all of these education experts, and I am shocked. You have the same problems we do. Uh, you have a bureaucracy that is entrenched and doesn't want to change. The difference is we have just been able to overthrow our bureaucracy. You still have yours. Choice has worked for 15 years in Chile. Full educational choice. 70% of the students attend public school, 30% private. The public schools are far, far better as a result of that competition. Choice is also being implemented in other Eastern European countries. If choice works all over the world, why don't we have the courage to try it here? We need a revolution as well. And, it, and I think it can be a peaceful one. It can be one that brings in public school teachers and administrators. Choice comes in many forms, charter schools, autonomous schools. There are many, many people in the public school system today who have bright, innovative ideas, but they're stifled by the existing bureaucracy. We want to liberate them. Just over the line in South Carolina, the state line, they're going to set up freedom schools. Freedom schools, as you may know, were set up in the 1950s and 1960s to make up for the inferior education that black children were being given at the time. Well, they're going to have freedom schools in South Carolina again. They're going to meet Saturday mornings, 9 to 12, 9 to 1. And they're going to provide enrichment programs for kids in the local public school districts. Well, who will teach them? Public school teachers who have Saturdays off, and who for one morning a week will be given a taste of what educational choice would mean for them. Freedom from bureaucratic constraints. 
from filling out endless pieces of paper. Freedom to innovate, freedom to be that which is the best within them. And I think they will realize that choice means not only a better life and a better future for parents and for students, but for teachers who actually want to teach as well and not just mark time. Again, the choice revolution is a worldwide one. And I think it would be a shame and a tragedy in an era when we have to compete internationally if we lag behind in this fundamental issue. Sean. Yes. We've got a lottery now in Georgia, and it is earmarked to fund the lottery. It's earmarked to fund public education. It's not kicked in yet. Do you have any observations on, on long term prospects, even short term prospects of education funding tied to the lottery? I don't know the specific issues in Georgia, so I don't want to presume. But I will tell you, having studied lotteries elsewhere in the country, uh, lotteries are usually a scam. And they usually go to very favored operators who have been planning for the lottery a long time. I remember in California, the, uh, the lottery company, the only lottery company, the only lottery company in California that was interested <coughs> in getting a statewide lottery wrote the ballot initiative, which brought in the lottery. Its specifications for the contractor who would operate the lottery applied to only one company, <laughs> the one who wrote the initiative. And they have done very, very well, thank you, ever since. Well, funny, funny how things happen the same all over. In New Jersey, they allocated the lottery proceeds to education. We found two interesting things. Over time, uh, other parts of the government grabbed a piece of it usually about 2 a.m. in a state legislative uh, committee room. And the definition of education kept on expanding, so that eventually it included uh, summer job programs and job retraining programs and all other kinds of things that I don't think are directly related to education. So again, I don't know Georgia's specific situation, but I'd be very skeptical. I also think it's sad when government has to raise revenue concentrating on ex the exploitation of people's foibles and failings. It's a sad day when government comes to that. This is a dynamic process. I don't think there's any one state that's in the lead. Uh, when I go around, I pick and choose, because you see elements of all of that. Colorado, just the other day, passed a charter schools proposal. Minnesota has had charter schools legislation for five years. There was an article in Friday's Wall Street Journal, I'm sorry, uh, Thursday's Wall Street Journal about that. Uh, Milwaukee, of course, has the functioning voucher program. Uh, private school choice, uh, funded by local business groups and other interested parties in Atlanta and other cities have, a, I think, a very bright future. The implications are, again, the few places where choice has really been implemented, not just talked about, the local public school district has scrambled <laughs> to innovate. Competition works. If competition works in every other aspect of American life, why shouldn't it work in education? Why shouldn't it work to bring out a better system? Now, I know a lot of people fear choice because Look, change is disruptive, but it doesn't have to be. Choice can be phased in. Pilot programs should be set up. I have no problem with that. If they work, let's go forward. A lot of people, especially in California where I'm from, worry that choice will mean all kinds of uh, undesirable students will be crossing district lines and moving in. No. Polls show that people want good schools in their neighborhood, and under choice, you will see an explosion of interest. You'll see Catholic schools that closed 10 years ago open up again now that vouchers are available. You'll see entrepreneurs, uh, religious parents banding together to open up choice schools in their own right. Uh, you'll see academics like Benno Schmidt, the former president of Yale University, go into partnership with Chris Riddle up in Knoxville. They came in and gave us a briefing. Look, you know, I'm skeptical. You know, Chris Whittle, let's face it, I mean, you know, he's a little bit of an, uh, a huckster. But I came away absolutely bowled over. They sat down with a committee of professional academics and educators, and they asked themselves a simple question. What are the common sense principles that should guide a school? What should the day look like? How flexible should it be? And they designed a school that meets all of those requirements. 
we had 13 people attend that editorial board meeting. And at the end, all of us wanted to sign up for a Whittle School. It's going to work. Every kid in a Whittle School will be given his own personal computer. Every kid will learn a foreign language from the age of five when they can most absorb it. Every kid is going to have the opportunity of attending school, daycare, or enrichment programs from 7 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. So that working parents will be able to look at a school as a resource center, not just a place that babysits their kids from 9 to 3. And she, given how much money we have spent to build these buildings, why shouldn't they be made available from 7 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night? It's a scandal that they're not. It's an outrage. And the competition of the Whittle School and others would force the public schools to adopt that same kind of schedule. I'm sure of it. I'd be happy if they just could read Karl Marx. I'd be, ha <laughs> I'd be happy if they could just read. <laughs> Well, you're, you're very kind, but I think you exaggerate. <laughs> oh. and, since then, and since then, the quality has gone down precipitously, I know. Uh, one of the advantages the American school system has, I don't mean to run it down entirely, we do turn out people, more of whom can think for themselves and are innovative, than certainly many students in rigid systems like Japan's or some of the European countries. But it is certainly true that you know, it is no great mystery to what makes a good school. If you read the book by John Chubb and Terry Moe from the Brookings Institution, the liberal think tank in Washington, they went and surveyed 3,000 schools. What they found, the kind of school that turns out a student who can think for him or herself is a school that is innovative, uh, has parental involvement, often has parents working as volunteers in the classroom, side by side with students helping the teacher, relieving her of mundane tasks so she can go and get about the business of teaching. Uh, it involves encouraging students to do their best, having incentives that mean students will actually see the kind of uh, results that come from hard work and learning. These are no, they are no great mysteries to what makes a good school. We have managed to construct a public school system which basically closes all of those options off. Can you imagine going to the teachers union and talking about using unpaid parent volunteers? to help out in the classroom, they'd, they'd have two words for you and they weren't happy birthday. So it's no mystery how we improve our schools. There are simple answers to improving education in America. They just aren't easy ones. John, yes, I'm sorry. John, do you have any uh, comments on the uh, possible use of litigation to get school choice uh, uh, going and get it imposed in given localities? Sure. Most states have a provision in their constitution requiring the state provide a fair, efficient, and comprehensive education. I defy you to go to many school districts in this country and find anyone who would declare what's going on there a comprehensive and efficient system of education. So parents, uh, black parents in Chicago and some Hispanic and black parents in Los Angeles have filed suit in the state courts of those jurisdictions to say, look, the state constitution is being violated. We are not getting the kind of education promised in the constitution. Give us the money and we will go out and find one for these kids. And that's going to be in the courts. And I suspect that other states could also follow that approach. If you file 50 suits, I'm pretty sure you'd win one of them. And that I think would go right to the Supreme Court. And I think the Supreme Court would look at that with great interest. After all, we have at least one justice on that court, uh, George's Clarence Thomas, who certainly knows the advantages of uh, choice in education and the sacrifices that his relatives made to send him through schools uh, that 
were able to provide him the leg up on the world, and got him to where he is today. So I think the litigation strategy certainly is effective. We fight on all fronts. Because the opposition is indicated by that quote from the California Teachers Association. They are implacable. They are defending a way of life. I don't blame them. No one wants to give up what they have. I mean, if someone came to you and said, you know, you're going to have to compete. I wouldn't like it either. But even though it may be a challenge to me, it's vital for the success and future of our country. And we have to look beyond our narrow self-interest. And that's what I tell teachers union groups, the few that make the mistake of inviting me to speak. <laughs> John, this country has one example of uh, public education of choice that could be helpful politically. After World War II, yes. the GI Bill of Rights put millions of us in school, and it was a national school of choice. And it helped this country's colleges secondary schools become the leaders in the world. And that was really the real. And you know the armed services still give the, the school of choice. That is an excellent point to make. Right now, we have a bizarre situation in this country. Up to the age of five, you can get vouchers for federal daycare under the ABC bill that passed a couple years ago. So <laughs> vouchers are given to kids up to the age of five. After 18, you get Pell Grants, which are vouchers to disadvantaged students to attend any college they want. The daycare vouchers go to any private or public daycare center. The Pell Grants go to any private or public college. So we allow choice for kids under five and choice for kids over 18, but no choice at all for kids between five and 18. Does that make any sense at all to anyone? I don't think so. I'll just take two more. Well, we turned them over for nine months out of the year already. <laughs> well, that's, right. that's what we're doing in K-12 May, right? I agree. Uh, look, again, public education is an important element of American life. It's not going to go away. The issue is not public education or no public education. The issue is whether or not we can force public education to once again be a system that is the envy of the world. We're asking public education to compete. It won't go away. There are a lot of good, decent people who can make it a great system again. We just have to give them the tools and the incentives to be able to overcome the rigid bureaucracy which is holding them back. One more? Can you explain charter schools? Sure. Uh, a charter school basically is an opt-out school. A group of parents, a community group, or a group of teachers can get together, uh, make a proposal for a new school. This would be a school that would be outside of the existing regulatory structure. It would not be part of the school district. The district would have to fork over a portion of the money it currently gets from the state or from the local property tax revenue to fund the charter school. In other words, the school district would have to improve. If it didn't improve, some parents and teachers would get mad enough that they'd apply to form a charter school and they'd take away money from the school district. And believe me, that's an incentive for the school district to improve because over their shoulders, they'd always be worrying about whether somebody would be forming a charter school. My prediction is that most school districts would shape up real fast and that charter schools would not have to come about in many communities. In a sense, the charter school would be the public school which has finally decided to reform. So again, it's a form of a way of injecting competition into the system, which as I pointed out, works in every other walk of life. Why shouldn't it work in education? No, I'm not as familiar, and I'd be happy to be educated by you. I, I was oh. asking the question. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't. John, I think the, to answer your question, I think we just passed the charter school bill, but uh, the bureaucrats are yeah. in control. Parents and other organizations can't form the schools. And no, no money will follow well. uh, the schools. I, I think the school will stand for it. You know, you, the key to choice is this. Choice is such a powerful, popular concept about 70% of Americans support it, that a lot of people are going to jump on the choice bandwagon and try to put forth sham choice. 
My advice to you is accept no substitutes. That's why I like the voucher or the tax credit or the scholarship idea, because that is a real choice. And maybe we won't get that. But driving for the radical forces the possible out in the open and allows you to accomplish that. If you, for, if you advocate scholarships, you're probably going to get charter schools at a minimum, and you may even go further. But beware of sham choice. John Le Carre, the novelist, said, follow the money. And in any debate on education, follow the money. If the money doesn't follow the student, it stays in the system, and it's going to be wasted. Thank you.